Hi guys, it's Mandy Ford here from uh, my house. You probably have heard that I am uh, quarantined at home. We've had um, just unexpected uh, COVID positive case with Preston uh, this week. And so now we are um, home for several weeks while we wait to see if the kids are eye test positive. As of right now, we're negative, but um, we have to quarantine obviously for quite a while just to make sure that we aren't out in public sharing. So we are home and um, it is great to come to you and thank you for, for technology that we can still do this. And I hope, I guess my, my concern in recording was just that it'd be really boring for you guys to sit and watch a screen. Um, but I hope that it's not. I hope that, um, that what God has given me to say speaks to your heart and that it doesn't feel like a really weird hour of watching a screen, but I just pray that it blesses you. Um, and, and it is fruitful. So, um, it's weird for me watching myself talk for this long period. So I'm looking at myself on the screen. So I'm hoping that's not a distraction to me either while I'm trying to, to speak and go through it. So I'm going to start with prayer and then I'll jump in and see how this goes. So, um, dear Lord, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for technology. I thank you for, um, still being able to share, even though I can't be there in person, God, you know, my heart and my desire for these women and for us all to learn to walk as solid women of faith, full of victory and triumph and just help set captives free. And so God, I just pray that, um, today throughout the rest of the conference, God, that, um, it would be a sweet time of transparency, of vulnerability, and even if those words sound scary, God, I just pray that um, help the women to see where life is in that and that we can be free because you have died to set us free. So God, open our ears and our hearts to your word and to your truth. Lord, I just pray that you would strip away any obstructions or obstacles to hearing this truth and help us, Lord, to live transparently. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So a couple of things I am going to have you do during this time is I, you will need a piece of paper to jot down some things and a pen so you can have those things ready as I'm setting up and, and I'll give you some questions and things to write down in a few minutes. Um, but have that ready. And it's not something that you're going to give to anybody. It's just for you to have. So, um, have that ready and we'll, I'll give you that in just a few minutes. So my talk today is on surrender. What I think is almost perfect, like, that here we are because it's been a, a crazy couple of weeks. Um, I was supposed to be leading worship for the conference. And then um, about a week and a half ago, I jammed my my foot on my right foot, which is my pedal foot for playing the keyboard and broke my pinky toe. So then I was in a boot. Here's my boot. I probably should be wearing it, but I'm sitting down, so I'm not. Um, and so then I'm like, great, well, how do I play the keyboard? So then I spent a whole day over my school fall break playing with my left foot on the pedal and seeing if I could do that. And I was just rejoicing because I was able to play with my left foot. And then when Preston started feeling bad on Saturday and then found out he had a positive test on Tuesday, it just was just so disappointing. And um, then I found myself again having to surrender and talk my kids through because my kids have missed out on tons of things being quarantined with their school stuff. And it's hard for them to understand, like, I'm not sick, but I can't go to school. I can't do the things I want to do and having to miss out. And I've had to talk to them about surrender, about how God is sovereign, how God loves us. He's not punishing us. We didn't do anything wrong. This is just living in this world. There's going to be things that come into it. And, and usually what God is doing is shaping us on the inside and looking to us to surrender to him, to trust him in the process and and just keep walking on and keep living. And so um, this has been something I've been talking to my kids about all week with surrender. And that's also what I'm gonna be doing with us today. So so if I was gonna give this a, a little talk, a, a title, um, I put unmasked before a loving father. And um, before COVID-19 and the coronavirus, this is the only mask I owned and here's my is my mask this would have been my mask that i wore if i was uh doing some sanding of some drywall before i painted this is about the only mask i would have had so i didn't breathe in the drywall this is this would be it um 
I also have this mask that I had for a ball. I wore this one uh, for a youth girl's birthday party. I think it's like falling apart. See, it's like burnt. Real fun, made this mask for that party. And my father-in-law, he'll put this on and say he has a, <laughs> that he has his mask on, which has been a, a joke in our family, which is, if you know Terry Ford, it still makes me laugh whenever he does it. Um, so, but now we have all these other masks. Oh, here's Mercy's. Mercy's got this, this sleep mask that she wears. Here you go. She can, so she can sleep good. And then I have all these other masks. So now in my purse at any given moment, I can have between five to 10 masks because usually my kids put sick all their masks in my purse and then we go somewhere. They're like, I need a mask. And so we're just pulling masks left and right. Got my, my work mask. This is a real comfy one. Got from our health insurance. Um, this is my little workout buff. This one doesn't work so good. We can put this one up here though, just to throw it on real quick. Wear that one around. These have been some of my favorites, the little stretchy runs from Old Navy. Put this one on, then you can change them out for your outfit to match. You know, now we're matching our clothes with our with our masks. And um, <laughs> I had to add this little prop skit in because I, as I was pondering masks over all these months with COVID-19, it made me realize like I'm not unaccustomed to wearing masks. Masks have actually been a part of our world long before the mask and especially if you're in nursing and doctors you're probably used to masks but i'm talking about spiritual masks and sometimes we can wear these masks to hide behind usually if we've been hurt if we've had um, a struggle or a trauma in our life a past experience something where we felt threatened and it felt like we had to protect ourselves we might wear a mask in that area we might put up a wall there or a wall here trying to keep us protected and and safe and we feel like we're safe if we can wear that mask you know we can act a certain way with this group of people we can act this way at work or this way at church or this way in our small group or this way with our children and our husband but then different with these friends and so we can even kind of become like we're these masquerading people acting in different ways and different circumstances and then we're not truly being authentic and real and vulnerable um but I want to say, I don't think any of us intentionally start wearing these masks because we want to. I think it's usually out of pain, fear, struggle, um, fear of rejection, feel of being honest and vulnerable and wondering if we can really be accepted for who we are if we were to actually take off our masks and if people could see the real us, would they love us? Would they accept us? Would they even know how to help us? And so um, that's what I'm talking about today. I'm gonna ask you to be very vulnerable with yourself and God and search your heart and see if there's any offensive way in you that God can lead you in the way everlasting. It says in Psalm uh, 139, Verse 23 and 24, um, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I pray that today that we can do that. And I'm only asking you to do that because this is something I have learned to do. And I'm also gonna give you some tools to fight the enemy today that I have learned in my life to, to fight against the lies of the enemy, um, sin, and struggles that we go through. And I hope that in sharing um, some of the tools that God has given me, that it'll give you more victory in your life and help you feel safe to take off your mask. Um, so number one, I want you to write down your first, your first question um, is, what is your current struggle? Um, or what is your biggest struggle that you're facing? This may be something you struggle with your whole life Maybe it's just something that's been recent. Is there anything holding you back right now from serving God? Anything from help from uh, acting in obedience to God? If you can say, when this is fixed or I get through this, then I could do blank for God. So take a moment and write down whatever pops in your mind. So do that now, please.
if you're still writing, that's okay. You can finish up. I'm going to go on number two. Number two is dream. Let's imagine that you're a young girl for a moment and you're full of hope and possibilities and you're dreaming with God about your future. What are you passionate about? What do you want to do? How do you want God to use you? What are you asking God for? So right for a moment, just number two, just dream. Take a moment. Like if there was no limitations, if there was finances were an issue, I'm talking about, and really not I'm talking about, about, about physical things. I'm not asking you to write down like, God, I want a nicer car or a bigger house. Like I'm talking like you want to make an impact in this world. How would you choose to spend your time if you could who would you help? Write that down for a moment. And then number three, this is the last one. What is your purpose? Why do you think you're on this earth? Well, there's a catechism answer that says to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And yes, that is why we're here as people, Christians. We are saved to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But is there a certain calling, a certain activity that you feel called to do um, to serve the Lord? So jot that down, take a moment. Okay, so if you're finishing up any of those thoughts or if any of those felt like, I don't know, that's okay. It's just for your own reflection, but maybe for some of them, if you weren't sure, um, especially the dreaming one, if you don't have a fresh vision from God, maybe that's something you could spend some time on in this coming week, just asking God to show you a vision for your life and just a calling that you can be passionate about so you can rally and fulfill your purpose um, on this earth and know clearly what that is because it, it just helps to guide the decisions and things that we do. Um, so today I'm talking about surrender and it can be very difficult to surrender because it makes us vulnerable. And um, so by, by definition, surrender is to yield the power to another, to give or deliver up possession upon compulsion or demand. So like, I think about surrender, I think about like waving a white flag and like, I give up, like, you know, and that can be like giving up to an enemy, right? Like I'm thinking about like in a movie um, where they might give up and and surrender to their enemies. And so that can be scary to feel like, I don't wanna surrender to my enemy. And I don't either, I don't wanna surrender to my enemy, like my enemy is Satan, right? Cause our enemy are, are sin. Like I don't wanna surrender to sin or anything like that. So, so the word surrender can feel um, kind of scary if you think about it from that perspective. But today I'm asking us to surrender kind of our, surrender our sin, surrender our, our the lies we've been believing to a loving father. So we are surrendering to God. First we surrender and we first come to faith as a Christian, surrender our lives to him saying, God, be Lord of my life, take everything, be everything to me. We wanna walk with him. That's our first step of surrender. But then there's that daily kind of surrender. I know, I know Missy's gonna talk more about, about that later, but um, I want us to know that we are surrendering to our creator, our loving father who says that he knit us together in mother's womb in uh, Psalm 139 and Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, the plans he has for us, plans not of evil, but plans of good to prosper us, not to harm us, give us a hope and a future. Like that is who God is. All of the punishment for sin was paid for on Jesus Christ. So we don't have to look at God ready to strike us down to punish us. We have a loving, good father who's Lord and judge, Lord of all. He is God, we are not. And so we can surrender to him knowing that he has good plans for us. And so as I'm talking about surrender today, that's the, that's the, the platform, I guess, that we're talking about surrender. It's, it's a loving father. We're going to sit under a worship and an adoration of a loving father in humility and service to him and let him lead and guide our lives. But as we're doing that, as we're surrendered, as we're walking with God, there can be opposition that comes after us. 
um, from the beginning in Genesis, there was the lie of the serpent um, to doubt God, to not trust him. Eve doubted God's provision, doubted God's plan, doubted his goodness to her, and feel like he's holding out by not giving her that tree of knowledge of good and evil to eat from. And she believed that lie of the serpent and she took the fruit and she ate it. And then she realized you know, she was deceived. And that's what we have. We have an enemy who is a deceiver. And, and so, and we know in John 10, 10, the enemy comes to steal, to kill and destroy, but Jesus has come that we would have life abundantly. And so today I want to kind of expose the scheme of the enemy. And cause I have, he, well, He's after, I mean, all of us. He wants to try to destroy us. He can't make us sin. He can tempt us. He can deceive us. He can throw these different lies at us. And my hope today is that you can see those temptations, those things as distractions to your purpose as a child of God and your identity child of God and as the plans that God has for you. They're just distractions. And my hope is you can see that and take away some of the fear of the enemy. We don't have to be afraid of him. We don't have to be afraid of evil. We don't have to be afraid of sin. We can live um, with clear vision for what God has for us. Um, but I've spent a lot of my life being afraid, of being afraid of, of sin, afraid of the enemy, afraid of, of pain because I thought, oh no, if there's pain, if there's these some things that come against me or against my family, am I just gonna crumble? And um, I'm learning by the, His grace to um, discern what's lies, what's not, and how to um, just stay focused on the mission of God and what He's called me to do. And and in learning that, and as God's exposed it to me, it's made me angry <laughs> at, at sin, it's made me angry at the enemy, and it's given me a new passion and a fire and I guess a dream to see others living victoriously. And I wanna share this so that hopefully if there's an area where you have felt defeated, that you can feel victorious as a daughter of God and walk in your true identity. So um, we're gonna be in the book of Nehemiah and it's kind of a long intro, but I just wanted you to, to know where this is coming from. And so I'm first gonna start by giving you some background into Nehemiah to set the landscape. And actually this like paragraph I'm gonna read is like straight from the beginning of my Bible and it gives like the, those background things. and. It just summarizes the big picture of Nehemiah, and then we're going to zero in on some specifics of Nehemiah and his life. And um, the big picture is when we do not feel safe, it is difficult to concentrate on the job at hand. The people in Jerusalem possessed no physical security. Their city walls had been in ruins for over a hundred years. The temple had been rebuilt many years before, but the walls around Jerusalem or in disrepair. Walls are important boundaries. They protect and shelter the inhabitants who live inside. They repel destructive intruders attacking from the outside. In ancient Near East, a city without a wall was vulnerable to raids and harassments of all kinds. A, a city without walls was unthinkable. In this unstable situation, Ezra, uh, the priest was trying to encourage the Jews to rebuild their nation and their lives. And, and I'll just pause for a second. When I was reading this the other day and preparing, it just hit me with, sounds just like where we are, right? Just like we are in America right now. We're facing a global pandemic, racial tensions, political tensions. We have a presidential election a few weeks away. Our country just feels like on the brink of just chaos and just, um, People are just uprising. There's riots everywhere. Um, a lot of areas are still like in quarantine shut down. Um, freedoms are being taken away. And this is crazy. Like we are in an area where our walls are broken down. Our nation and our lives, a, a lot of them in the world, they're in ruins. And uh, we are in disrepair. <laughs> our nation and our world and our individual lives, you know, maybe even not even just for us. Um, personally, but maybe uh, maybe we have family members or others that are lost that we can see their fam their lives just in disrepair and falling apart. And so I feel like through all of this chaos externally in our world, God is calling us to look to Him. He's calling us to be the repair of the walls. He is wanting to us to turn to Him as our Savior. He is our Savior. He is what the world needs. We need Jesus and we need repair. So can I get an amen? Okay. Um, 
At the same time all this is going on, Nehemiah, who's a cupbearer for the king, Artaxerxes, he's away in Persia, he's not even in Jerusalem yet. When he hears about the situation of Ezra facing Jerusalem and the walls being torn down and Ezra's trying to rebuild the nation, he literally sat down and wept. Nehemiah approached the king and asked to go back to build the walls. And the king granted, granted him favor and resources for the job. And Nehemiah was off on his mission. So now we see the man, Nehemiah, he is on a mission to go and to do the dream that God has given him. Okay, so I'm trying to connect now. Nehemiah is kind of going to be our example throughout this story that we want to ha- be like Nehemiah in this story. He is a good example for us of a man who loves God, who is 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 on mission for God. His life is not about his own comforts, his own um, pleasures. His life is about doing the work of God. And so he's going to be our good example as we're looking at the scriptures. So now we're going to turn to chapter four. Um, And I'm going to read some different parts and then we're going to kind of break it down. But I'm going to start by showing you. So now that Nehemiah is there and he's trying to do the work that God has for him, we're going to see him come up against some serious opposition. There are men that do not want to see him fulfill his his calling, his mission. Um, the enemies do not want to see them build the wall. They want them to stay vulnerable and weak. And ladies, can I tell you, the enemy does not want to see you be in repair. He does not want to see your walls of faith. He doesn't want to see you rise up as in your identity of Christ. He wants to keep you broken down, living in the past, living in a false identity, of, of, of shame and guilt and things that we've done or said in our past. He does not want to see us realizing the fullness of who we are in Christ. So as we read Nehemiah, these are all going to be like spiritual warfare kind of examples um, of what's happening on in the physical is representing what's going on in the spiritual, in the heavenly realm, things we can't see. Okay, so we're going to we're going to see that here in chapter four, um, verse one, it says, When Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And you can just hear that mockery and that tone, just ridicule. It reminds me of how the, they, the, how the guards mocked Jesus when he was, you know, put the crown of thorns on his head and they spit at him and they ridiculed and they mocked him. Okay, mockery is a definite sign of, enemy, of warfare and the enemy coming against us. Okay, so here we see they're coming against him with mockery. They're teasing, they're making fun, they're harassing him about what they're doing. Um, down in chapter 10, I'm sorry. Verse 10, Chesalon chapter 4 says, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out. There is so much rubble. We cannot rebuild the wall. And also our enemies said, Before they knew it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to their work. So now the people, they're starting to get like, starting to listen to the lies. The people are coming after them. They're feeling attacked and they're getting afraid. And so now they're like, Oh no, now they want to kill us. So we see like this opposition, it's breaking down the Israelites. They're starting to feel like they can't complete the work. They're feeling threatened. They're feeling harassed and they're feeling weak and feeble. And they they are starting to kind of listen or believe the lies of the enemy. And I've been there. Like, you know, you start start to doubt and wonder, like, can I do this? Am I good enough? Am I, am I strong enough? You know, can I, do I have that ability? And we start to doubt and seeds of doubt are never from God. God doesn't want us to trust in our own strength, but in his. And so when those doubts come, we can know that that's not of God. Those are from the enemy. And it's the lie from the beginning with, with Eve. It's doubting who God is to us, doubting who God will be for us. But thankfully we have Nehemiah that calls the people. And if we read on in, um, So we're still in chapter four. Now skip over to verse 14. It says, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of the men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. 
and the officers posted themselves behind all of the people of Judah who were building the walls. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and a weapon in the other, and each of those builders wore his sword on his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me, and he told them, whenever you hear that trumpet, you're going to come to me. You're going to run and rally to us, because that's where the battle is going to be. And he says, and our God will fight for us. So guys, we're going to we're going to see opposition in our lives. We're going to have these enemies coming against us. But when we join together as women of faith and as we as we um share our struggles and our things, so we're no longer alone in our battles, but when we come together, we are stronger and the enemy cannot stand against us. When we come together under that surrender of God being our everything, then he will fight for us. And so we see this plan going on and, and they are able to continue their work and they're going and they're building and the walls getting close to finished. But that's not the end of the opposition. There's still more opposition that's coming. Now look over in chapter six and there's further opposition to the rebuilding. Now, um, this is where we're gonna spend the rest of our time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read um, this portion and I'm gonna break it down to us. So we're gonna start chapter six. I'm gonna read through verse one through verse 16. So read along with me. Mine's the NIV. It might be a little different than yours, but that's okay. It says, when the word came to Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sambalat and Geshem sent me this word, come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono but they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sanbalant said his aid to me with this message and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, it is reported among the nations and Geshem says it is true that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Judah. There is, sorry, in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. Now this report will come, we'll get back to the king. So come, let us confer together. But Nehemiah says, I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. Now I prayed, now strengthen my hands. One day I went up to the house of Shemaiah, son of Delaliah, the son of Metabal, who was shut in his house. And he said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you by night. They are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away or should one like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so I would commit a sin by doing this. And then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophetess Nodiah and the rest of the prophets who have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. When all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Now that's a big story, but there is so many points here that I want us to focus on now because I want us to see the spiritual forces that are at work. The spirit like, talks about in um, Ephesians 6, spiritual warfare, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but spiritual forces in the heavenly realms, okay? So there is a whole spiritual world going on, like what Pastor Jimmy's been talking about. And when those things are coming at us, what do we do? And I want us to model our reactions like Nehemiah. So let's see what was happening and hit Nehemiah's response. So if you're taking notes, the enemies, what are the enemies doing? Let's look at the tactics of the enemy so we can know how to stand firm against it. Number one, we see that they are scheming to harm. In verse two, they are scheming to harm me. 
Okay, our God does not scheme to harm us. Our God is a good, loving Father. It is our enemy who schemes to harm. So when situations come into our life, God's plan is not to use that for evil against us. No, like me breaking my toe, like that was not like God punishing me. No, that was just something that happened. Now my response to it, I can either use that situation and I can let it, you know, take me down a dark path and be depressed or whatever, but, or when we can take that situation, whatever it is, and just say, okay, I'm just gonna roll with it. I'm gonna go on. God strengthened me to continue to do my work in a boot. And there we go. So are the situations don't necessarily dictate, they're kind of neutral, okay? They're neutral, a lot of our situations. Some situations can be bad, but when we can still choose how we respond to it and asking God to help us to respond to it in His way so that the enemy doesn't use it to harm us and using it for harm. Instead, like Romans 8, 28, He can work all things together for good who love Him and called according to His purpose. Um, number two, we see uh, multiple attacks there are repeated assaults against Nehemiah, against his character, against the, even the right reason why they're doing it. They started calling in his motives and saying, the only reason Nehemiah you're doing this because you want to be king. And he's saying, no, that is not true at all. Um, I'm doing this because God's given me this mission to do it. And Nehemiah's heart was pure, but they're attacking even his motive and saying that he had ill intentions, that his motives were wrong, that he was doing it to promote himself. Um, we see that in verse four and verse five. But we see that they don't just like say this one time. It's not like, um, you know, they're calling it one time. Oh, like you just want to be king. Nope. It says they came back four times. It says four times they sent me the same message. And each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time they come again. And so we might see that in our lives. We might see just repeated assaults against our mind, against our thoughts, against our marriage, against our children. And we're thinking, God, God, why? I've already had this happen and this happen. Why is this happening now four and five times? And we can sometimes get discouraged. Okay, guys, the enemy's goal is to try to break us down over time. If we are trusting in our own strength to get through it, we'll probably get weary. We'll probably get weary. We might get discouraged. We might start to wonder, is this, is this true? Is this really happening, right? Is this really who I am? I start questioning our identity and those things. And his goal is to want to shake us, okay? But how do we combat that, right? Well, we combat it by, by sharing those struggles with other people, letting our, our small group, our, our Christian friends, our Christian women, people we can trust, um, speak life and truth over us and pray for us bring those those struggles into the light. If we're going through uh, a difficulty, we need to not rely on our own strength, but um, to rely on others to hurt, to encourage us and to help us. Um, number three, speaking lies. Um, verse eight, I love Nehemiah's response when he gets that what they're saying. Nehemiah says, nothing like what you're saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. I think so much of our battle as Christians, you know, we've heard about it happens in our minds. It's the battlefield of our minds, the warfare in our minds. And there's so many things that the enemy like to throw at our minds to get us off track. Again, distraction, trying to get us off of what God has called us to do, the mission he's called us to do, calling into question your integrity, uh, your motives, why you're doing these things, bringing up your past. Like if they knew what you did, they wouldn't let you serve on the children's ministry. Or if they knew like your past, like you wouldn't be a greeter, like, you know, and all those, like those thoughts and those lies, even if things um, that we did are true, we can get stuck because we don't fully let go of those things and, and believe that that's in the past but also just, just straight up lies, just things that are not true. And so, um, especially who God is for us. And I just wrote a couple of notes, lies like, you'll never be able to overcome this. You'll always struggle with this. God can't forgive this. And whatever it might be, um, those lies uh, about who, who God is and who he wants to be for us those can come and they can come like rapid fire against our thought life. And, and I love just Nehemiah's response, you know, in the midst of the crazy and the chaos of the lies, he says nothing like what you were happening. 
the book book you're saying is even happening. You're just making it up out of your head. And sometimes we need to just call it what it is. When they are flat out lies, we need to call Satan who he is, a liar. That is a lie. That is not true. And I'm not listening. I'm too busy doing the work that God has for me. I'm too busy doing the task that God has called me to do. And I'm not going to stop and engage in this conversation because I've got work to do. And I think sometimes I don't have to do this. I mean, as I overthink and overanalyze and that can be a problem. But just sometimes just taking that, that Satan is a liar. He's a deceiver. And I'm just, just no, just no, I'm not even going there. I got work to do. I've got friends to encourage. I have children to raise. I got, I have kids to teach. Like I got stuff I got to do. I've got time for this, right? And so sometimes we have to be like, just no, not going there. Um, and then number four, the enemy's weapons. Okay, we see in verse 9 and 13, they call them out, intimidation, fear, casting doubts, threatening ident- identity and integrity. These are some of the enemy's weapons. He wants to intimidate us, make us be afraid. And um, for a lot of my life, there's been a lot of things I've been afraid of. Um, spirit of fear, as I've been taking off the mask of fear in my life, um, has been in so many different areas. And I used to be ashamed of that, but now I am so thankful because um, now I know the more opposition that comes against me and my family and my life and my callings just shows me how much God wants to use me in those ways. And so the greater the struggle, the greater the breakthrough, the greater the opposition to you and whatever work that you're doing, the greater the opposition in Nehemiah was the greater the purpose and the and the, the kingdom purpose that God had. The enemies didn't come against Nehemiah when back when he was being the cupbearer in another country that came against him when he was active doing the work that God had called him to do. When we are active doing the work that God has called us to do, we can guarantee the enemy is trying to throw any any intimidation, distraction, temptation in front of us to get us to stumble. It doesn't matter what it is. The enemy wants us to be distracted to the purpose that God has for us. He does not care which sin you are you struggle with or which sin you're tempted by. It can be pride, self-righteousness, or it can be food, or it can be adultery. It can be anything. He really doesn't care. He just wants something something to be there that he can use to bring shame and guilt and condemnation and intimidation and fear to keep us back from being the women of God that he has called us to be. So now that we are, um, we are called him out. We know his schemes. We know what he's trying to do. How do we respond? And I just want to empower you to know that you have been giving everything that you need to defeat and stand firm against the enemy. Because the blood of Jesus, he's already been defeated by Jesus. And now we now get to walk in the light and we get to um, take control of what we think about, take control of how we respond and how we act because the power of Jesus lives inside of us and gives us that power to do that. So Nehemiah's response, how does he respond? This is how we should also respond. Number one, rejecting the lies. We see in verse eight, he says, nothing like what you're hap- saying is happening. No, no. When those lies come, we have to stand firm and say no. And it can be really hard. I know in the midst of, in the midst of our, um, our own stuff, it can be easier to see the lies sometimes in, our, in a friend's life or somebody else's life which is why I think it is so important to share with a trusted Christian friend. Just this morning, um, I was doing my Bible study time and a friend had texted me and was checking on how I was feeling. And, and then I just said, hey, how are you doing? And she sent like this like little emoji with a tear. And I just like, oh, we need to talk, you know? And so I called her and we talked for a long time and she was sharing um, something that was ha- happened last night and this morning in her home. And, and it was easy for me to discern the lies that were going on. And so I just started telling her, okay, like this is this is warfare. This is gonna be coming against your family. Like this is what's happening. And I was able to stand firm with her and pray for her and encourage her. But you know, when it's you and you're in that place, it's so hard because sometimes we're so close to the situation with our kids or in our marriage or in our family. It can be so hard when we're in it to see the light and the truth. 
That's why it's so important to bring a trusted friend into that place with you so they can fight for you and stand firm and expose those lies. I've had women in my life. I know Missy and Lori have been some of the ones in my life who have helped me to see, okay, this is not true. This is the enemy coming against you in this way and you need to fight and you need to stand and this is what's true. And those firm words have been life to me when I thought that I was sinking and dying. You know, like when you're just weighted down by things and situations and they feel like too much to bear. We need our sisters to gird us up and say, okay, no sister, you know, that you have not been defeated. The enemy is defeated and you are victorious and this is why and this is how. And I know they've prayed for me and they've stood in the gap for me when I couldn't fight for myself. And that's what we need sometimes as people that can do that for us on our behalf. The other thing we see number two for Nehemiah, his response is we pray. He prayed prayer. He prayed for God to strengthen his hands. Guys, our, our number one weapon against um, the enemy's lies is prayer, is bringing those things into the light. Um, now, sometimes we can be afraid to confess. I think sometimes either either sins we've committed, we, we can be afraid of bringing that stuff into the light and fully disclosing all of it. Um, sometimes we just want to ignore it and like act like it's not there, but it really is. And it's just festering under the surface. And so um, we need to bring those things um, to the light and allow God to to deal with them and allow him just to dismantle it. And so a lot of times what I'll pray is, you know, God, you know, but here's one example. I, w- <laughs> I was watching um, a movie with my kids this week and it was about a, a, a child that had cancer. And I think as, as a mom for me, like that's probably me impressed in like our greatest fear is losing a child. And I think a lot of people can feel that way. And so um, Gabby, my 13 year old is loving movies of kids that have cancer and like watching these movies and, there was one on called the cloud and, um, or cloud. And, and so we've been watching movies. So I'm being home this week. So we're watching this movie. And as a mom, like I'm like grieving as this mom in the movie is walking through this, um, with her child and I'm, my heart's just like ripping apart. And, and, but it just, it kind of opened up a wound inside of me of realizing like, that's an area where I really struggle to let go of control. And so actually but sometime this morning in prayer, just like, God, that watching that movie just showed me how much like I struggle, you know, with that and seeing kids suffer. And, but also like, I know God, if I ever had to walk through that with my child, I know that you'd be enough for me, but I've doubted that. So I had to confess and repent, like, God, forgive me for not trusting that you would be enough. If I were to walk through that with a child, if I were to lose a child, that you would be enough for me. And God forget, and just like, you know, just even letting that wound in my heart, letting like that, that tension, bring it to the light. That doesn't mean that that's going to happen to me by talking about it with God, but it's just bring it to the light and saying, God, I don't want that, that ever to be a fear that takes hold of my heart. Even just like a, what if fear, you know, because God, I believe that you will be enough, that you will provide everything that I would need to grieve and get through it. And that I, I could still praise you on the other side. God, help me to praise you no matter what. And so I just think as those passing thoughts even go through our brain sometimes, it can feel just like a random thought. But I didn't want a thought to be in my mind that that God wouldn't be enough for me if I had to go through that. That I had to like even preach to myself that God, we God, if I went through that, you would strengthen me to be the mom to help my child get through that. Or if I even were to lose a child, that you'd be enough to get me through that. And so sometimes even confessing, I think these, these what if scenarios that can create anxiety and, and, um, and even come like a stronghold in our lives. I'm learning how to even take those thoughts captive to Christ because I just want, I just want to, <laughs> I just want to, I want to live victorious. And I've seen how, I think a fly just flew in my ear, um, to see how, how God can, um, I don't want anything to be between me and God. I just want to live transparently before him um, so that even my thoughts that pass through, just filtering those with the light of scripture. Um, and also uh, we see Nehemiah's life, number three, discernment. What is real? What is not real? And helping us to live in reality. You know, Nehemiah was like, these things are not true. So I'm not going to spend my time like being distracted by them. And that's kind of like with my, my example I just gave for me, you know, um, I don't shouldn't spend my day sitting there uh, thinking about things that are not even real and they're not even reality. I shouldn't be weighed down and worried by things that aren't even true. 
And I, and I have been, I've done that. And um, maybe we all have in different ways. And so just bringing those to God, I'm like, okay, I don't want this to hold me back anymore. I want to be about, I want to live in today and, and live to the fullness today, whatever God you have for my life. And number four, resist temptation. Uh, in verse 13, um, they, they were trying to get Nehemiah to go and to kind of save himself and run to the temple and to hide. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to sin by going to the temple when I'm not supposed to be in there and, and give a bad name to discredit me. And I love how, how integrity Nehemiah is. He wants to be a man of integrity. And so should we. We should be women of integrity, resisting temptation. And when those things come, just asking God to help us to stand firm against those temptations and to walk in the light. And then finally, number five, Nehemiah completes his assignment verse 16, they were able to complete it with the help of God. Um, I want to get to the end of my life and with all of its crazy bumps and, and twists and turns. And as many times as I may fall, I want God to say, but you did not give up. You persevered and you loved me through it all. And you completed the work in your life. And I hope that's your desire too, that we can get to the end and we can say, with confidence, you know, it was not perfect, but I loved God and I, and I lived my life to worship him and to serve him no matter what, though the enemy might've come against me. I trusted in him though. I may have fallen God carried me and got me through and that's living a life of surrender. It's not that we get it all right. It's not that we don't stumble sometimes, but we that God promises to see us through if we will seek him and follow him. And now it's in closing. Um, I really just wanted to, I really wanted to be there in person and pray over you guys and, and be with you to pray for you and over you. And I, and I hope that even people would come to the altar. And if, if you feel called to do that during this time so that people can, can pray over you and, and really be there for you in a physical way. Um, but I just want to pray uh, for chains to be broken, for shackles to fall. Um, as I was preparing for some of this, I was thinking, you know, um, some of us may know, okay, Mandy, this, these aren't just like nothing, like what you're saying is happening to make out of your head. That's not true of me. I know that I am right now I'm living in sin and maybe, maybe that's where you are. Maybe it's not that you're completely innocent. Maybe it's that you have been guilty of committing acts of sin and you know that and, and you want to be done with it. You want to be free. You don't want to live that lifestyle anymore or that, that habit or that struggle. And you want to be done. And you're like, I'm over it. I hate it. I, I came here this weekend hoping <laughs> that I could leave changed. I was hoping that I would encounter God in a way that I wouldn't have to live with this anymore. And for that is you, then amen, sister. Like you came to the place. I want you to know that God is more than enough to deliver us from anything. So um, I'm going to be praying for those that know that they need to be set free from something, that those chains would fall. Um, also for those of just even thoughts and struggles, like, Maybe for you, it's not that you're truly guilty of like, you know, these acts of sin. Maybe you just really struggled with your thought life and anxieties and you've made up these scenarios and things in your brain and, and, and that's just created all this additional stress and you want to be free of that. And so maybe it's the sin of worry, uh, maybe more of a, a mental struggle. We're going to pray for that. Um, and it's so important to have confession and repentance because if you read on, please do later on this week, Nehemiah uh, 9, chapter 9, 8 and 9, it talks about um, the people, once they had the wall completed, they had the, the book of the, the law brought to them. And, and Ezra, the, the priest there, he read through all of God's word. And as the people heard God's word, they realized how broken they were, how messed up they were and how much they needed God. And they started confessing all of their sins, just telling everything. And then once they were done, they stood up and they worshiped and they praised. Guys, it's not that we're perfect. We are, I'm not perfect. I struggle 
every day with something that I have to bring before the Lord, just because I desire to live in such purity before Him. And if anything, I need to give myself more grace. Um, but but when we truly are um, bound by things, we need to be delivered. And if, sister, you're sitting there and you're like, okay, I'm good. I'm not, that's not my struggle right now. I'm actually, there's nothing. I feel, I feel clean. I'm good. Then awesome. That's great. Pray for your sisters in the room. Be, a, be an encourager. Pray for them. Um, maybe a family member that you know that's maybe struggling with something. Or our world, our nation needs prayer right now. So we're just going to enter a little time of, of just prayer. And um, I'm going to pray for us. And then once this video goes off, there might even be, I don't know, some, some music that's played and an intimate time of just prayer. And I just ask that everyone just be honest before your father. Don't hide it. Don't hide anything that you're going through. As we surrender our lives to God and follow his will, he will transform us. He will make us like Jesus. He'll make us more like him. But we have to be honest about what's going on inside. So let's pray. Dear Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we just call on your name, your name that stands outside of time. I thank you, God, that here I am on Thursday morning, but can be praying for chains to be broken on Saturday morning. For God, you stand outside of time and you are powerful and you are awesome. And I thank you for the blood of Jesus that was shed so that we could be cleansed, so we could be free, so we could live, God, this life for you, unchained, unbound, without being held back in restraints, but free to serve you, free to love you, free to help and love others. God, I pray right now over every seat that is filled in that room and those listening online, God, I pray, God, that you would send your Holy Spirit presence, God, to move mightily. God, any chains that are hindering them from living the Christian life that they desire to live, I pray that broken name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus, God, in every way that you've even delivered and set me free. Father, will you set me free from spirits of fear, from anxiety and depression? God, I just release that freedom in the name of Jesus, God, that you would break every chain. God, every lie, God, that has come against these women saying that they cannot be forgiven, we break that lie in the name of Jesus and declare, God, that you are more than enough. You are more than enough to deliver us from anything that would come against us. You are more than enough to set the captives free. We thank you, God, that you are the chain breaker and that you have come to give us new life abundantly. God, we pray that you would turn our mourning into dancing. We pray that you would turn our sorrow into joy. We pray that you would turn our, our sin and our shame into a testimony of your faithfulness and your goodness. Help us, God, to be gracious to one another. Help us to be merciful to our sisters. And right now, we just turn our hands up to you, God, and surrender. And God, we just do your work. Have your way. We give our hearts to you. Purify our hearts. Let it be as gold and precious silver. Lord, we pray that you would have your way in this time. Holy Spirit, move. Heal where they're broken and hurting where their walls are in disrepair, God, we ask that you would go and bring healing. Where women have been harassed, God, we just say no more. We just bind up every spirit of intimidation and fear and say you are no longer welcome here. We are surrounded by the power and the presence of the living God and you are no longer welcome. Go back to where you came from. You cannot harass us any longer. God, we Holy Spirit come and fill every place where intimidation has taken up root. And we just pray that your peace would reign. God, I pray that you would empower us, strengthen our hands, God, to do the work that you've called us to do. God, you know the, the plans and the purposes that you have for each lady. Just like Nehemiah prayed to strengthen his hands, to complete his task, God, strengthen our hands to be the child, the children of God, the women of God that you want us to be. Strengthen our hands, God, to be wives if we're married, 
Strengthen our hands as mothers or grandmothers to be the women, God, that an example that you call us to be. God, when temptation comes, help us to flee. Help us to hide in the shelter of your wings, O oh God. Help us to resist and to stand firm. Help us to put on the full armor of God every day to stand against the enemy's schemes. God, we are no longer unaware of his schemes. God, I thank you for these tools that you've given me to recognize the lies of the enemy. And when things come, there's our flat out lies. Help us to call it what it is. It's a lie. And help us to live our lives in your abundance, doing your work. God, give us fresh purpose. Give us fresh vision. Your kingdom come and your will be done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I pray that after you've gone through just even that set time of searching your heart, continue just to, I guess, keep an attitude. I don't know what the mood's like in the room right now. So if it's in a, an atmosphere of just repentance and confession, then praise God. Um, if you feel like celebrating because you feel delivered, then rejoice. Um, sisters, encourage those that need to be encouraged. Pray with those that need to be um, prayed for. Look around you. See if someone needs a hug or a tissue. If you um, feel like you need need prayer, please go to the altar and let um, let women come and pray over you and pray for you. Don't bear your burdens alone. You are not alone in this battle. You have an army of women around you wanting you to succeed and are there to encourage you. And so I pray that you would receive that encouragement. Um, I wish I was there. <laughs> wish I was there so much, but um, I just w I'm praying for you right now and thinking about you and, and just hope that um, this encouraged your heart. If I could encourage you in any way, please reach out. Um, you can email me, forward period mandy at yahoo.com or you see me at church whenever I'm back. Um, or you can call me. It's 423-438-8062 is my cell phone number. And um, I just pray that you would know how dearly loved you are, what a precious commodity you are, that your life is full of value and purpose. And if the enemy is coming against you, it's because he does not want you to fulfill all that God has in mind. And you are powerful. You are powerful, full of the Holy Spirit, and that terrifies him. So walk boldly in your calling. Do not give up. Do not retreat but finish the work that God has for you to finish. Be like Nehemiah and build that wall. Complete the task with God's help, for God is on your side and nothing is too hard for Him. Um, I love you, and I guess it's time to say goodbye. Have a great rest of your conference, and I hope to see you soon. <laughs>